Hey there, welcome to SaaS and Dawn podcast. I'm your host, Anna Dana, head of growth at a SaaS group, a serial acquirer buying wonderful SaaS businesses to take them to the next level. And here I chat with inspiring founders and experts to get an inside scoop on how they made their business success. And today with me is Jan Niklas, co-founder and CEO of the Value Case, uh, a software that simplifies the collaboration between customer facing teams and their buyers. Their vision is to uh, redefine how millions of B2B sellers and buyers across the globe interact to close deals. And it's really fascinating to learn how you do that. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, and thanks a lot for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing. Cool. All right. Let's 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 dig in. So uh, I guess uh, we should start with your background and, uh, you know, yeah. what value case is actually and what was the inspiration behind the product? Cool. Thanks, Anna. So uh, I'm Uniqlas, one of the co-founders of Value Case, and thanks a lot for the, um, for the introduction. Um, what we do and where we're from, um, so we are a B2B SaaS company, as you said, from, from, from Germany, currently with around 10 employees. I think important for this podcast, we are VC-backed. Let's discuss about the difference be between VC and bootstrapping later. Um, we are based in Hamburg, Berlin, and a couple of people across Germany mostly, and serving um, companies across Europe, so pa pan-European, um, starting to also venture out uh, in the U.S., we are building sales tech and as, at least historically sales tech that has been built or at least grown a lot, uh, a lot in the, uh, in, in the US. Um, you already mentioned a bit what, uh, what we are doing and ask about, um, where, where does this come from? Maybe just from a very personal perspective. I grew up, uh, my career started in, in management consulting at McKinsey in a bit different way. I'm a data scientist as background. Um, so I used to work a lot with, with, with large data pools, also a lot in sales and marketing and that across B2B and B2C. And like a few, five, six, seven years ago, when I started working there, it was, there was always a striking difference between what you have in B2C and what you have in B2B in terms of what you know about your customer. I mean, as we know from B2C, all of ourselves, when we use phones, it's just, insane and even frightening what you can track, right? Where you come from, what you do, what your actions are. And you can ob obviously optimize a lot in B2C, especially e-commerce, um, how you engage with your customers, what you show them, recommendation and so forth. And then um, when I was working with my teams for a couple of large brands across the world in B2C, and then I was coming to the B2B world, um, working with Salesforce data pools. And I re remember I was just like shocked what you don't know about your customer and how much you are actually um, in the dark, in between the calls you have with them, right? Yes, you send them emails, you send them calls, you have meetings, but the magic actually happens in between. When you as a consumer go to a website and research stuff, the B2B world that happens inside um, of a buying organization, if Siemens buys software, there's not one person buying, but 10, 15, 20 people interacting, but you have literally no clue about that. That was all too challenging for us from, from both a data perspective, um, helping our, our customers um, or clients to, to improve. And data back then, like three years ago, got me thinking, why is that? And, and, and why don't I have that in the B2B world? Wouldn't it be great? Or I mean, what if I would have that medium also in the B2B world in complex B2C, uh, B2B sales processes when I interact and sell to a company over well, multiple months with like 10, 20 different stakeholders. What if I wouldn't do that via email and 10 other fragmented channels, but there would be that single nod where I collaborate with my customers together, share everything. And what that gives me, of course, is that central nod where I capture everything. Yes, it makes it easy for my customer and, and, and they will love it. But for me personally and internally, I know everything from A, from beginning to end, what is happening. And that was like the infliction point for, um, for Value Case um, two and a half, three years ago. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, problem to solve. I think so many sales managers uh, would love to have this, uh, this tool or, or something similar. But um, let's, let's go back to like zero to one. Right, because again, great idea. It seems like you've got a, a wonderful background to build something like that. You've got a team. Um, so what were the kind of the 
first steps? How did you start validating this? And um, then how did you come to to raising funds and actually building the product? Yeah. Um, so I think in the very beginning, when we validated Value Case together with my co-founder, Leonard, um, it was obviously a very different time compared to today, right? I mean, most people will, will still remember it was uh, beginning of 2021, uh, end of 2020. It was a spree in venture capital. I mean, just to, to also be very honest, there, there wasn't actually for us a thought around, do we do bootstrapping or do we do we raise VC? At least in our bubble back then, it was like, it wasn't even a question. Unfortunately, you could argue, but that's... Uh, maybe for, for, for another question. So it, it was all geared towards uh, what do we need to show? What kind of proof points do we need with, for this initial idea to raise the, the first round, a couple of hundred thousands, maybe, maybe up to a million in, in funding to actually build a product. So it was always the idea to have the idea validated to then build, build something. And what we did is um, we had a quite a rich network, um, also from myself, inside of the um, um, parts of the sales, world, which I think it's 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 one of the crucial things to have. And um, we literally just did interviews, so like, like a huge LinkedIn outreach, uh, trying to understand which messaging does work, what are the different things people react to, and then literally trying just to um, speak to. In the end, I think it was over 60, 70, 80 different leaders across different roles, across different companies uh, about our idea, our problem, what we're trying to first ideas about how we want to solve this um, to really get to the point where we say, okay, here is like a first mapped out a bit like smaller area of a problem that we think is worth solving. And here is a first idea of how this solution could look like. So in the end, it was like actually mostly if not exclusively speaking to a lot of people in the field who ideally could also become our customers, to be very honest, right? Like should always be to some degree, our user or buying persona. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, I think that's a great approach, but uh, it's, it's fascinating how you said, you know, it wasn't even a question because I think in 2021, it wasn't a question for, for a lot of people, whether, you know, to raise or, or go bootstrapped. Uh, and when I talked to founders, that uh, they started their companies in 2020, uh, 2021. Yeah, it, it's kind of um, usually the same kind of picture, right? Like, why say no if it's like it's literally just there? So, how long did it take you? And through this, maybe LinkedIn outreach, um, going after um, you know industry leaders and thought leaders, have you found any? Um, potential investors there or did it help you somehow like spread the word and because you validated this idea uh, to get the funding? Yeah, actually, we, we did find uh, one angel investor who then in, in invested later on. But uh, what we mostly found um, wasn't from an investment perspective, but more from a customer perspective. So from this outreach, I think the first five customers, we actually converted as development customers from from, from that very initial outreach from early on, where it was just like an idea and discussions and like whatever, a couple of months to half a year later, some of them became our um, development customers. Now, uh, when it comes to investors, we were, um, so our first investors was P Picos Capital or is Picos Capital from Munich. And um, early on, we, uh, over a couple of connections, I think dipped separate from that outreach, actually. It was more our personal network where, um, we got in touch with them and with a couple of others and started at some point it developed a bit into a validating the idea together, right? They were validating the idea for themselves. We, we were validating the idea for ourselves. At some point it felt, well, I mean, it just makes sense now to do this together. And then, well, I mean, there's obviously need negotiations and everything, but it, it somehow developed into that process from a separate, uh, I would say outreach from a separate perspective. And back then that initial round wasn't a huge trade show or where we said like, okay, now we do a huge outreach, but it more developed from our personal network, from our careers before. I think that, that first, that was completely different for, for our next fundraising. Like after bringing Picos on board, um, about a year later, 
Um, we raised our second round um, in total, then three and a half million. Um, and that was completely different. And this is also what I would do maybe next time, like also for the first one is preparation is everything and creating a structured list of what are actually the people I want to work with. Why do I want to work with them? I think for us, of course, always thinking about when you bring angels on board, um, I think a crucial value add is that they can be your customers or they know people well who can be your customers. I think in the sales world, a VP sales or an SVP sales or a CRO for us is a great angel. Um, not exclusively, but I think that, that, that was going to help. So planning that out meticulously, um, who do I want to reach out to and why when it comes to angels, but also VCs, um, I think is, is one of the key things, especially for the second round was a uh, critical success factor. Why it was, um, especially back then very successful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that makes great sense. First of all, you choose like who you want to work with, right? Because it's your company. And if it's just, you know, you're in your co-founder, especially, uh, you want to have another person on board that, <clears throat> sorry, could potentially help you or could potentially introduce you to somebody else. And if you're working in sales, uh, especially if, uh, if it's enterprise sales, then obviously like having someone with a great network, is um a huge value add so i completely understand what you were looking for yeah, yeah maybe, maybe just one additional point just this that comes to my head is and in the end i mean when it comes to structuring these, these processes um around fundraising i mean in the end it's a numbers game right so yes network helps and i think why this preparation is so important is it it won't help you no matter how good you are if you reach out to 10 people it or and or creating that right it's uh, in the end it was i think hundreds of people we reached out to or got an introduction to which i think is even more powerful and um, ideally you always get an introduction uh, and don't have to reach out cold which can also work well of course but like getting an introduction and finding an introduction path i think is was for us extremely um uh, extre extremely powerful and this is also where I think having a company or a VC like uh, Picos Capital early on on board was like super helpful, right? Obviously, they have done it multiple tens, hundreds of times before. We have not. So um, learning from them how to run such a process, I think, was very helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So were you able to uh, to leverage the, uh, you know, the power of the VCs and angels that joined the company uh, to find your first customer or did it happen uh, in a different way? Um, it was actually the other way around, interestingly. So finding our customers mostly um, in the very beginning, right? The first, I think, five customers we also actually signed um, was uh, based on our initial outreach on LinkedIn when we validated the idea. And then afterwards, we obviously continued the outreach with a different messaging of not any more validating, but hey, we start building a product and then we continue to iterate on that messaging. And, but we actually found a couple of investors that had relationships with one of our early customers, meaning it was either other funds that were invested in our, um, in, in, in our customers or angels or individual people that were related to our first, first customers. And when um, we were popping up in board discussions or management discussions as a new super powerful tool for sales and revenue, obviously sales is always one of the most important things um, you, you discuss in, in, in these circles. It was actually that way. So we, some of our um, in, investors are also investors of some of our customers and early customers. Okay. All right. That's interesting. So uh, you, you uh, kept talking about messaging on LinkedIn and uh, a lot of people have been uh, very upset about it and like the whole experiences and, uh, you know, have been iterating on their messaging for a while. And uh, here on the podcast, uh, they were shared quite a few like techniques and hacks, like how to nail your um your LinkedIn messaging. And one of them was even sending audio messages on LinkedIn, uh, which worked for the company and which was kind of like groundbreaking. So um, maybe it's, it's a bit early to ask, but still like what worked for you to, um, 
to get those initial customers? And how did you uh, work on your messaging later to, you know, to keep those relationships going and to maybe further uh, in the development, get more customers? Yeah. Um, I mean, that obviously has changed over time, right? From, from the very, very early days um, from development customers to having the product. And now where you say like uh, we have a, already the, the second version of our product live selling it actively um, since, uh, since more than a year um, from the very beginning, or I think, but what do you see throughout the time is I think two things. One is what I always like. Um, and I always try when it comes to messaging that you provide value to the reader, right? I'm personally, and that might be different things. I'm, I'm not a fan of just provoking questions or, 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 being too salesy and trying to bully people, I always like keeping a mindset of providing value. And that can be as little as a small statement. So one of the best messagings for us that work is that 95% of the um, interactions you have with um, when you do B2B sales, you actually, you are not in control of because that happens inside of the buying organizations. You are actually only controlling 5% as a seller in the few emails you send and in, in the actions. While everyone might know that being confronted with that, if it's not 95 or 90, it doesn't matter with that fact, um, worked for us magic in terms of, in terms of, 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 uh, of messaging. And another example is that these days, and that, that has changed a lot over the past 12 months, is that B2B sales in the end is a bit like project management, right? Um, you could argue it is, especially if you're not talk about the very small SMB, but from mid market up. Um, uh, sales, you talk about multi-week, multi-month, sometimes if it's like seven figure deals, multi-year deals, um, where in the end, it's like managing a project full stop. And most people still do that via email, but no one else is managing projects via email. Why? So these kinds of, um, general, well, themes we try to follow and work great for us. So providing value and then keep get which gets people thinking and full stop. Yeah. I think that's, that, that's one of the key things. And the second part is obviously, and that's like easier said than done is that only works if there's obviously a pain you are addressing. Right. And that is something um, you, you obviously need to find over time a lot with experimenting. So for us, what we are doing right now um, is we are experimenting with, uh, especially for messaging tests with meta because obviously while that is on Instagram, for example, that's for B2C, but I myself also sometimes on Instagram and I see B2B ads, um, especially for, for, for messaging, but you can do the same on LinkedIn. I'm just doing very simple messaging tests, A, B tests uh, with like limited budget um, works very well for us. Um, and then only actually investing into creating ads that follow the end or reach out via email and so forth. That's interesting. I agree with you. Like you have to, you have to provide value and you have to solve some kind of problem. So today, just today, this morning, I got this uh, message on LinkedIn and um, like we, we, we barely know each other, right? We, uh, I, may, I may have uh, invited this person to an AMA or something and we started talking a bit and what he uh, messaged today was, uh, hey, like there is your email right there on LinkedIn can I sign you up for this new M&A newsletter where, you know, it's going to be um, a bit of, you know, the trends and the news and M&A and our opinion on it. And I was like, okay, that's just, just a little bit ballsy, right? Because I may not need that, right? I have a ton of newsletters in my inbox, right? But at the same time, hey, I don't need to do anything. He will just sign me up for it. And B, it's M and A. It's something that I'm, I'm interested in. It would be great if it's a good newsletter. It would definitely be for me. So uh, I completely agree that you have to you, know, you have to read the room and you, you know who you are talking to before before you message them on LinkedIn, uh, because LinkedIn had really bad reputation for for bad messaging. And uh, yeah, I'm yeah. glad I'm glad you guys are trying to change that. But uh, that's great that you started talking about sales, right? And a lot of people are curious about, you know, sales and sales haven't been easy uh, this year. 
so uh you're redefining <laughs> your you're smiling <laughs> so i think they haven't been easy for you guys too uh but yeah okay so redefining sales uh what do you see from your customers and what do you see for, from your own experience what is the kind of the um biggest problem and where is it in the sales funnel <clears throat> yeah i'm i'm just smiling because it's a bit for us a double-edged sword so what has happened i mean this is no news over the past 12 months is that uh, and we see that i mean you can read up on it and we see it ourselves and we see it a lot in our customers is that um Budgets have obviously gotten smaller and not only gotten smaller, but also pushed up, pushed up the ladder. So um, while two years ago um, there were sales teams where a team leader of it in a big org could just buy value case for five people, um, that rarely happens anymore because he j just doesn't have the authority anymore to buy it. But it's centralized, especially in bigger orgs, to some central um, function. And now, and that of course makes it much, much harder to sell. And typically that, that increases, uh, increases sales cycles. Now that is a challenge also for us, like for most other B2B SaaS, uh, companies. Um, on the other hand, that's exactly why you should use value case. And that's exactly what we, what we help companies with, right? Because everyone is feeling the pain that you used to work with two people and then you could make the sale over six weeks. Now you have for the same deal, or even a smaller deal, you have to work three months with uh, five, six, seven, eight people. So how do you make sure that you run this process tightly? How do you make sure you inform not only these two people, but the five people, which you might not speak to everyone too, but there might be people who only speak to the person you speak to in the buying organization. So, so how do you make this sure? And this is what Value Case helps you with, right? Um, in, instead of sending emails after emails, you invite them to a collaborative workspace in, in your own brand identity, where you have your mutual close plan, like a project plan of how to run this, which, which you agree with your customers. They find all the materials, whatever you would, sh would share by email, they always find in that one spot. And that was, that of course is great for us. So what happened over the past 12 months, a lot more people see the, the, the pain because the pain has just uh, grown, grown bigger. So I think that's that's like two things we see in the market and also how companies are are countering. And I think a second one, obviously, I said at the beginning around that the pie is getting smaller, right? And that you obviously see top of funnel um, that there are just less companies in the market that are whatever market it is to buy a certain solution. Yet there are probably a similarish number of companies that are offering a service competing for these smaller number of, of leads, right? So I think uh, what we saw, but also a lot of our companies saw that, uh, customers saw that on LinkedIn ads, for example, on certain words got like skyrocketed in, in terms of customer acquisition costs. Um, I think on average, so they, they used, there was a, um, a benchmark that they increased, like doubled roughly um, or even more customer acquisition costs especially on paid ads over the past, uh, over the past 12 months in certain, um, in certain areas. So, and that is something you could argue, can you change that? Maybe we don't offer that much top of funnel. So, and um, while you can use value case for that might be a separate discussion, but let's assume that's given, right? So you have less leads. What you can do, of course, to make this at least the same, if not more money or more growth is how do you make sure you close more and not your competitors. And meaning if you have less leads, how do you make sure that there's no fuck up uh, during the sales process? How do you make sure it is executed diligently, that there's, there is a project, it is run, and it is run to the best possible way you can run it so you increase your uh, win chances, right? And I think that's something companies uh, invest a lot. We see more and more um, sales companies who already have or sales -like companies who have a sales team invest in enablement personas whose or revenue operations whose sole purpose is to and, and, and their their KPI they they are measured on how much of BAEs um, attain quota um, how how much are we winning and um, yeah so this relentless focus on execution um, excellence is something we see actually across of our all of our customers which might be a bit biased 
because that's one of the reasons they write by value case force. Right. Well, it's Let's good to it have excellent that. customers, right? So um, another, um, another question that popped up here on the podcast quite a bit is again, a, a bit of a bias, right? Whether we should have sales teams that are in-house or outsourced, or, you know, if, mm -hmm. it, if they're in-house, should they be literally in your office? or could be remote. So, uh, and I think only one of the, of the guests, uh, told me that, you know, he absolutely believes that a team should be in the office over there, you know, just having that little bell because it just brings everything to a bit of a different level of motivation. But what do you think? Well, I mean, there is, so I have a very strong opinion about um, in-house versus outsourced, which is in-house for me, um, except for, of course, there there might be times to bridge or you have so much uh, demand that you can't um, serve the demand, which is a great problem to have. And then you say, hey, I can't hire fast enough, so I, so I work with someone and or very, very, very top of funnel. Um, maybe when it comes to SDRs and generating leads, potentially, but when it comes to sales and then sales manager, AEs, I have a very strong opinion about that. This should be in-house, especially if you are, I mean, it should be always like that, especially in the early stages. There's a, just so much you learn when you talk to your, um, uh, talk to your potential customers, to your prospects. Yes. The main idea is of course, converting them and getting them as customers. But even if you don't, which there's probably has never been a, a conversion rate of hundred percent, I guess is in all the other discussions, you learn so much about your product, about your positioning, what messaging does work, what are people looking for, um, also informing your product strategy, right? And I, I just can't imagine that you will learn the same if these people are not your people versus they are outsourced. There is just this different um, um, bridge. And similar, I would even take it further. If you're early stages, it should be some or even all founders doing sales, right? Um, because exactly of that, right? This is, I mean, one, you are the most, I think, credible one to sell it. And the other one is, of course, you are the one who also has ideally the uh, view across all functions, especially product and marketing, and it all just ties together. Um, so talking to our customers, it should be you and, uh, not, not someone else. And I, yeah, I also believe that might be something to continue over time. And a CEO should always talk to customers, no matter how, how large you are, but, uh, that might be a different question. So office versus remote. If I could have a world like I want it, it would be everyone in the office with a clock because you just can't replace, especially for a sales team, listening in, how does someone does a call? You just learn so much faster if you sit next to each other. Yes, there are call recordings and you can bridge all that, but you are, I am a hundred percent for myself sure you're always slower if you're remote versus if you're in, in office. And yes, that might be more important if you're early on versus if you have product marketed fit and there are hundreds of people and then, then it might be less, less relevant. And at some point it's obviously not possible anymore. If you have teams like our customers across different countries in Europe, um, but then at least having a team uh, in, a, in a location, um, I, I firmly believe and gives you a competitive advantage. Now, Reality might be yeah. that you don't find the best people if you say you have to be in Berlin, uh, as an example, right? So, and now I can't give you the silver bullet of, of how to balance these two things. But um, for us, especially in early stages, and if I would redo value case for us, it was a bit different. We did via during COVID, you wouldn't be allowed and you couldn't work in person anyway. But especially in the beginning for me, as long as possible and as strictly as possible that you have one team, one location. And that in the beginning means as a startup, your full team. And at some point this might mean um, a sales team and the product team and the tech team um, being in one location with the letter being in brackets, I think product tech structured via ClickUp or Jira with tickets works super well remote. And also here, yeah, full stop. <laughs> Um, I think that's, that's a bit my, my opinion. And maybe one last thing, 
office doesn't mean everyone has to be five days a week in the office, right? That is something I don't believe. I think that's personally over, whether that's two or three days or one day or four days, I, I don't know. But even having the opportunity to be there next Wednesday because everyone is living in Berlin or Hamburg or wherever, um, I think is, is uh, crucial. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it, uh, it is a strong opinion. Am I the only the second one who says it's, uh, it's office or if I understood it correctly? I, yes, yes. So, okay. yeah. And, but, but I, I mean, you went, I think, a little bit uh, further even. So, like, um, uh, the first one was um, Tony Paris. Uh, they're, they're building this uh, wonderful thing called Bluebirds. And they're also uh, great for sales teams. Okay. And he was, uh, yeah, he was just the, uh, the advocate for, for being in the same room and having the bell. Uh, to, you know, to keep everyone motivated. You went a little bit further with the clock and everything, but um, it's interesting. Uh, so how many people out of 10 are salespeople in value case? Uh, you could argue, well, two or three, right? I mean, my co-founder, Leonard, and myself, uh, we both do um, sales and we will, I mean, for us, it's even different, right? Uh, our customers are mostly revenue people, sales, onboarding customer success. Um, we sell a software solution, but you always also have an opinion about how to operate it, how to do sales. And when you buy value case, you also obviously to some degree buy time with us. So we also are opinionated about certain things. How should you run mutual action plan processes? Um, so this is for us different, right? I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's our passion. So, that's why, obviously, I want to do sales. I, I want to work with my customers. So Leonard and myself, we do dedicate a lot of our time on sales, uh, onboarding, and, 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 and customer success. And um, then there's one more person, so we're three, I would say. Um, okay. Not three times 100%, but uh, three, three people parts of the time. Okay. I mean, it still works. You have a, you have a tiny team still, but, uh, could you tell me maybe, yes. uh, you know, you said you had, uh, your development customers, right. And by that, I assume you mean that, that you were using them as your, you know, trial runners and, uh, uh, you know, we're developing, Guinea pigs. yeah, right. For them and, and with them, <laughs> hopefully they won't hear that, but, um, or maybe they will. Um, but yeah. Okay. What moved the needle from there, right? What was the point where you realized that, okay, this is somehow ready to go big, you know, and when you realized that, um, you know, this, this might be even bigger than, than you, um, well, imagined it at first. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to development customer rights, I think it's always crucial to have a, I mean, you will typically have, a piece, at least in B2B SaaS, I would argue a handful, maybe up to 10, 10, 10 companies. And you need to make sure that these are somehow representative of, of a larger, that they are a sample of a larger um, a group of, of companies. Because in the end, it won't help you if you build like a fully custom solution for these five to 10 companies, because they might require something very specific that others don't need. And then you end up with a product that works fantastic for five to 10 companies but doesn't really work for the hundreds of thousands of companies you actually want, want, want to sell to. Now, I, can, I think that that's one of the key things um, you, you, you need to juggle. And I think that was a bit like the first inflection point when you start working with these development customers, you start building the product, product in beta, always show them, iterate. And then at some point you say, hey, okay, um, this is now the point where I feel comfortable bringing on board more customers. and I. That is probably always, you should always do it earlier than you feel comfortable with because uh, the sales processes take longer than you think. And um, uh, in doubt, uh, I, I don't know if I like fake it or make it, but uh, just go out and, and, and talk to comes. And I think the first time where um, we felt like this could go really big was when we announced like, and we didn't have many followers uh, on, on LinkedIn yet. Um, that our first beta is live and compared to our product today, uh, there was a very rough version. We started building in no code. Um, and then after validating with no code to learn and myself as a data scientist and Lana has a lot of uh, front end experience um, uh, in development and design as well. 
were able to still build ourselves, which I think was also um, a very good thing as founders to be able to build uh, your own product. And when even that product uh, solved like a huge pain, and I think we signed the next three, four customers who didn't have any relationship with us before um, on that product, I think that was one of the first infliction moments. And the second one was after a year um, when we started building our proper product in full code um, uh, with like long-term architecture. And we released that a bit together with the announcement of our second funding round. There was like such a strong inbound demand, just people um, coming to us. It was like September to November um, or like Q4 2022, um, who from like across Europe, whom I have never heard of, they have never heard of us before, like such a strong inbound demand. That was really a like pivoting moment with like, okay, this seems to be hitting a nerve. Yes, we've raised on this like quite some money. Cool. But that doesn't help long term if we don't find actually the customers uh, wanting um, and, 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 and working with the product. Right. I think that's that's um, a, a key infliction one. And a third one, I think, is um, with the existing customers. When we look at net revenue retention and adoption, I think that's one of our two key and most successful metrics um, um, when that shows you that customers continue renewing and your nrr is north of 130 uh, percent that they keep adding seats that they keep adding teams that they that there are teams coming from internal hearing about the product they want to use it as well even beyond sales onboarding their partnerships team coming to us hey this would also would also help us a lot um, collaborate with our partners and seeing that, that, that a product organically makes it moves inside of one organization than across organizations, um, I think that's, yeah, what was, was also for us a, a key moment where it's, okay, this is something that, that's hitting a nerve. That's a great one. We, we just talked about it um, with, with another founder, and uh, he calls it team-led growth. And I think that's kind <laughs> of the, yeah, the best way to, to move because, I mean, um, Look, look at Slack, look at Figma. And I mean, uh, it's it's not like maybe you, you have the aspirations to to build the next um, Slack or Figma, but still it's a, I think it's a great sign for um, for founders that the people organically adopt it once they see um, what it does. So perfect. I just have a, a few more questions. And um, the first one, well, because, you know, 2023, has been uh, very unexpected. I don't know. Um, I still don't know how to, how to think about it. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I don't know, mixed feelings. Um, so what has been in 2023 that you've done for value case and you thought, you know, would never work, but worked for you and changed something for the better, if anything? Mm, I mean, if you look at 2023, right? So I was just talking about Q4 2022. Um, it it could not have been more different, maybe not Q1, but if you compare Q2 2023 with Q4 2022, I mean, as for many, many other companies like our customers and ourselves, the, the world in SaaS was a very different one. And I think we, I would still attribute it to the change in budget, right? There was still... I mean, you could argue already, it should have been the beginning of 2022 when, when things were slowly with uh, the war and uh, interest rates coming up, but it really manifested in the 2023 budget, I believe, where people started at the end of 2022, look at the next year and realize, okay, things have actually changed and they are here to stay. So the budget changed. And that for us, I think, um, was one of the key things to just because something worked at the end of and over 2022 very well for us, realizing very early and also taking a bit of a leap of faith that this is here to stay. So we need to reinvent and especially iterate and reiterate our, our messaging from nice to have this helps your buyers buy to, um, the world is a different world now. Um, um, yes, your bias is still important, but actually you need to make sure that you run a tight process, that you 
have your sales process under control. And that's why value case is not a nice to have, but a must have. And I think that iteration over Q2 2023 and pretty much changing completely how we message, um, how we position ourselves and even to the degree of how we help our customers, I think was, was super crucial. I, yeah, obviously I don't have an AB test how the world would look like for us if we would not have changed it, but, but uh, giving signs now and, and seeing what is top of mind of uh, VP sales and CROs and, and other revenue leaders we, um, I speak to on a, on a weekly basis is, um, I think is, that was definitely the, 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 the right move and rather change fast than, uh, and potentially fail. Of course, there were multiple tests and experiments that failed drastically. But uh, in the end, uh, I think we came out with, with a good change in, in, uh, in messaging. That's wonderful. And well, speaking of fails, uh, the next question is obviously about the biggest win and the biggest failure uh, throughout the life of value case. Mm, maybe reframing it a bit to, I don't know, it's like, like learnings or um, the, let's say the, yes. the, 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 the hardest part, um, which is similar, right? I think... Um, one thing um, that we learned over time is, especially as founders, right? You are, how many you are in the founding team, you are in the end the ones that, if you strip everything away, you are the captain. So you're the, you should be the last one standing, ideally. Uh, meaning, while it's obviously not everything is about you, um, you should stick to your beliefs. And there are things you actually shouldn't compromise about. And I think there was something... I don't know if it's like a single failure, but, but sometimes we probably compromised a bit too much on our own beliefs, trying to make it right for others instead of saying, hey, um, we are the right founding team for this problem at this time. This is something we, we, we must believe in. If we don't believe in it, we should stop doing it, to be honest. Um, so we should be who we are and um, then we will attract the right people and other people who don't believe in the things how we do them they won't work with us. And that's fine because that's like um, one of the things. And that, that, that has impl implications hiring, um, which, which of course is also, I would always say, one of the, one of the most, uh, most, uh, most challenging things um, when it comes to in the early stages. Because yes, from my time at McKinsey, I, I think interviewed over 200 people, but it could be more different. Uh, and I, I could even argue, I thought like, hey, I'm so good at interviewing. Um, in the beginning, actually, I wasn't. Uh, I was good at interviewing a pre-selected, very targeted um, group of people who uh, don't need any carrot or anything, um, and they, they want to do something versus uh, hiring someone for design or tech or sales. This is like so different. And content-wise, but also what you need in a startup, right? You need mission believers, product believers, um, and, and, and sometimes in hindsight, if you don't know yet, so the one you as a founder, you should always master the process first, I believe, and only then hire hiring will never fix a problem that you haven't fixed yourself. Um, I think, and in doubt, rather start with a freelancer. And then when you understood the process, move on, on to hiring. And that, that's probably something, I don't know if like the biggest failure, but one of the big learnings, especially from the first year. We had, um, um, or I had, um, uh, had myself. Mm. I think the the when it comes to the biggest wins, I think there's just one or two things also from learning wise is adapting ultra fast and being the longest to survive and making very sometimes maybe hard or drastic decisions fast versus dragging them out and then dying slowly. I think it's one of the key things we. I think we were luckily quite quite good at, especially when interest rate changed, we were still able to, to raise quite a big round in like two steps. We were literally finished raising a round in June, 2022. And then we were like, shoot, uh, now everyone says you need 24 or 36 months actually of run rate. Yeah. But what we raised doesn't bring us there. So yeah, let's go out. Um, we were in a very lucky or very successful position to be raise even 40% more than we initially raised then over the next two months in a market where 
close to no one was able to race. That was great. I think that was one of the key defining moments of uh, of Valley Kiss. Uh, if I if I look back. Okay, that sounds good. All right, uh, and well, obviously, you know, the the last one is about hack, right? What has worked for you in I don't know in growing value case or maybe in avoiding those situations where you learn rather than enjoy the process? Uh, so yeah, anything that worked for you that maybe could be could be useful for, for other founders? <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's per se a, a huge hack. And I, I don't want to say I don't believe in these magic golden bullets that now from one day to the other, because in messaging, now you uh, add an audio message and now the world changes. Could be for some people, maybe. Um, I, um, for us, I think consistently um, that preparation across whatever whatever you do is uh, is is actually everything it 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 might not be a hack per se but for me as a founder covering out enough time to pe- prepare for whatever is required there is i mean for me preparation uh, for example for sales meetings right there is no gold bullet now i find this new messaging and now people just come here and uh just buy what i have to offer in the end, it's, um, I think, ultra hard work and hard work in the end means preparation. It means attention to detail. And uh, at the example of a, of a sales meeting, for example, um, going in, researching the company you speak to, um, making a stakeholder list, uh, who, are, who might be the influencers, what up is the talk track, what is the um, exact meeting minutes, um, how I, I think I want to run this process. Um, what might be their pains? What do I know about them? Yada, yada, yada. Um, carving out that time and reserving that time and not sacrificing on that time. Um, and that goes across, right? That goes for interviews when you hire for HR. That goes for this podcast, not uh, going saying, ooh, uh, it's starting in five minutes. What do I tell about it? That, that might be also myself, um, how I'm, um, uh, how I work. But for me, um, never sacrificing on preparation time and um, rather prioritizing what you do and cut out stuff. If you don't have time to p- prepare, it means you have to just don't do something else and select fewer things you prepare for um, is, uh, is, is uh, one of the things I strongly believe in. And what helps me there. Um, Leonard always made fun of me because I was still one of those, those people using a um, handwritten to-do book, which uh, was very ancient. And I was resisting change. After months, I then I actually took the time and uh, I found for myself, um, trialed a few things, Zunzama, like a uh, um, prioritization personal to-do app. And that really helps me to prioritize. And then including preparation time and everything. And then it tells you when the day is flowing over, even if your day is long and you can just cut out stuff you don't do rather than doing everything mediocre. I think that's uh, uh, not sure if that qualifies as hack, but uh, that at least something that works for me very well. Cool. All right. Well, uh, at least I could definitely go, go and check the tool because uh, honestly I've tried <laughs> a lot of stuff for, for like for preparation and for, you know, me managing too. the tasks and nothing worked. I mean, I've got, um, cause we, we were preparing for this podcast a couple of months before. And, uh, since then I went through three notebooks. So I was trying to like find where <laughs> the topics were that we discussed, um, for this yep. w- were. So yeah, I think it's still, it's still the best, still the best way. I mean, good old pen and paper. Uh, so yeah, it could be qualifies as a hack. Um, but um but yeah thanks uh thanks for bringing it up i think um yeah i think it's a great story uh what you have there and obviously you're moving fairly fast and uh you know it's it's fascinating to see what you're going to do next year and how it's going to change for you in 2024 so happy to do it again sometime and uh yeah thanks for being here cool thanks a lot anna 
I'm also, I mean, I'm, I'm quite excited for 2024. I think what we learned from 2023 is not like expecting anything. So, or, or expecting the worst. I don't know. Let's, uh, let, let's see, but I'm, I'm actually qu quite excited about it. Yeah. It built quite a lot of resilience in, in many people. So it did. Maybe for the best. It did. All right. Yeah. Thanks for so being too. here and uh, take care. Thanks, Anna.